So when it gets to the end of a plan of care, you're working with somebody who has FAI, you know, some of the symptoms may or may not go away. And I shouldn't say symptoms, but probably more of range of motion limitations. There could be certain things present that are always gonna be there. Zach mentioned in the previous videos, cam, pincer lesions, there are bony changes sometimes that we are not going to be able to change. But regardless, there are some things that we definitely need to think about as we finish up our time working with someone and Zach's gonna dive into it now. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because that goes back to the original conversation of how did this individual get to us in the first place? Were they direct access? Were they referred from an ortho? Did they have imaging? Did they not have imaging? So what's already been communicated to them either by us internally or by another healthcare provider in regards to the expectations? Um, and sometimes if they do have those, those anatomical changes or abnormalities, it's going to be something where, yes, if you try to find an area of discomfort, if you look hard enough, you'll probably find it with FAI. And I'd argue if you took the majority of the population, put them on a table, and searched for pain with flexion, adduction, and internal rotation, at some point you're going to get that pain. It just depends on at what point do you hit it. Do you hit it at 90 degrees of flexion or do you hit it at uh, knee to shoulder and with full adduction? And there's a big difference with that both produce pain, but one you're searching for, and one of those positions they may, may never even need to or find themselves getting into that position. So I think benchmarks, your easy benchmarks that you're looking at are our range of motion. Has there been any changes from day one? Are they hitting what we would consider adequate range of motion landmarks for that individual? And I think that's where context needs to be put into play because you need to figure out what does this individual actually require to function on a day-to-day -day basis or to uh, perform occupational tasks or their leisure tasks. Um, and that's going to play a large role in regards to the amount of range of motion they need, the amount of uh, pain-free range of motion that they need as well. Other things that I like to look at is uh, just localized strength testing, either formally or informally, whether it's your traditional orthopedic manual muscle testing, of hip flexor and adductor complex. Is that as symptomatic as it was on day one or is that absent? Um, ideally, something as low level as that should not be present with the symptom profile at time of discharge. In the weight room or in the strength training environment, things that I'm looking at is what's their ability to hold a uh, Copenhagen um, side plank or how far along that progression have they gotten into will give you a very good idea of functional competency with the adductor complex. Uh, what does their ability to hold a front plank look like and the ability to control lumbo-pelvic orientation um, against gravity with duration will give you a good idea of just an isolated measure that you can do very quick and quickly uh, quantify and qualify in a testing environment. Um, some of your supine abdominal progressions that you've probably gone through with them in a strength training environment will give you a good idea of the combined motion of lumbar flexion and hip flexion, can they control it? Is it problematic? Are they getting pinchy? And I bring that one up because that tends to be one as people transition back into just their own personal um, workout routine. That's one that I've noticed they find pain with. I think of like a bicycle crunch or something along those lines where you may not have done it in the clinic, but as they start to try things on their own, those tend to be um, environments where they feel a little bit of, of discomfort with that. So other things that I like to look at is tolerance to impact. So if you have an individual who's looking to get back into running or jumping or playing a sport that does that, have we taken them through pogo testing? Have we taken them um, either through hop testing or if not necessarily hop testing, have we just seen them train in the clinic in a plyometric environment, demonstrating competency, demonstrating um, movement quality and movement strategies that we feel are appropriate? And are they doing it from a performance standpoint that meets the demands of what they're trying to get back to doing? And then multi-directional competency as well. Things with uh, FAI that they're probably gonna struggle with the most is getting, other than sprinting, is getting into and out of lateral directional changes and being able to plant the foot on the ground, load into that hip, and redirect the other way, or just simple pivoting, regardless of what depth they're getting into. Um, so pivoting, rotational motions. So those are things from a strength training environment that could be as simple as doing like a lunge matrix. 
Can we go forward? Can we go sideways? Can we open up? Um, how can we get into all of these different positions that are gonna put that hip through all the degrees of freedom and can they tolerate it? And then have we taken them through different locomotive patterns on the turf, um, almost mimicking like what a dynamic warm up would look like uh, going back into a sporting environment and then just progressively doing that at faster rates and with higher demands. Yeah, no, when I think about later stages, I think about two things really. It's like uh, how much are we gonna have to modify training environment? You mentioned bicycles. I was thinking about V-ups a little bit, like out of a hollow hold. Um, and then oh, I think- Toes the, to bar, things to, like yeah, that. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes sprinting, to be quite honest, just with regards to how rapid and how much range of motion has to go through sprinting. So obviously there needs to be kind of a, a graded progression um, of a you know re return to run program, ideally getting them back to that high amplitude, high rate of force development environment where you're gonna have significant hip flexion and hip, hip extension going over and over and over again for a, for a certain period of time. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts on when you might you know clinically determine if somebody was direct access uh, hey, at this point, you know, we've gone through a course of care. I don't quite know if you're, you're, if you're good. Like at what point would you have potentially brought in an orthopedic leading up to that later stage where maybe you're gonna, you're gonna tag? I think day one for me, the biggest thing is what brought the symptoms on? And is this something that they're just intermittently noticing with activity? Um, and it's been going on for a few years. They can still do everything. They're just looking for answers at this point. That's gonna be somebody I have less sense of urgency and I just have the conversation with them as to what I find during the evaluation, what I think we're gonna have high likelihood of changing and what, what other things are gonna be kind of a time will tell type answer. And then I try to get as, I try to have the conversation with them of what timeline are you comfortable with? These are things from a mobility or strength standpoint that I feel very confident we can change and I expect it to take you know, two sessions or two weeks or four weeks this is going to be more of our um, part of the program that falls under we don't know until we just try it and with them i like to figure out all right do we have an event that we're trying to get back to so maybe it's an obstacle course race maybe it's a crossfit event maybe it's a marathon is this in four months and they need a three-month training window so we only have four weeks to work with before they need to start getting into training mode that's gonna be somebody that I might say, I have a really good grasp on what we need to work on and I think we have a pretty good um, level of success, but just to safeguard ourselves and avoid the worst case scenario, here's an orthopedic that I really like and that I trust. I want you to get in with them just in case things don't go as planned, we've already established that plan of care. Um, so the, I think getting an idea of what their sense of urgency is and the sense of urgency of the, the presentation at day one helps with that. If I have somebody who's coming in who's highly symptomatic or they have a mechanism of injury that's suggestive of potential labral pathology as well, that may be somebody that I am getting them in with an orthopedic earlier or telling them if we're not seeing change by X visit or by X date, it's less likely that this is just a simple soft tissue issue or just a movement awareness or quality issue and we may have things either intra-articular or just anatomically that are at play that are gonna be limiting our progression. And I'll usually communicate to the patient when I am referring them out to the orthopedic, I, I don't try to speak for the referring provider that I'm sending them to. I don't try to predict what's going to happen, but I typically lay out what is an expected plan of, or I'm sorry, what's an expected visit going to look like. Is this an initial consultation where they're just going to be relaying to them what's going on that's supplemented by our notes that we're sending and we're just kind of establishing that plan of care? Uh, is this somebody that we've already seen for a few visits and we're communicating to them and the provider that we've either hit kind of a roadblock or a plateau in progress and we're looking for either further confirmation from a diagnostic standpoint or just further confirmation of, hey, we're on the right route. This is just a, gonna be a little bit stubborn and it's gonna take time. And I like having that second voice coming in and saying that, um, or you're just throwing your hands up and you're putting yourself at the mercy of another provider saying, I've tapped out what, what I feel like I can do, what I know comfortable I can do well. 
do you mind giving me some help on what you think is going on and what the best plan of care is moving forward? And a lot of that comes down to your relationship with who you're providing them to as well. I have, um, I have some physicians in orthopedics that I'll, I'll give them a text early on, hey, I've seen so-and-so for four or five visits. This did not go as I intended it to, or we're having just a presentation that isn't textbook, or it's not following up with what I thought it was going to go. I would love to hear your input and just see what you think is the best route moving forward. Do you think imaging's warranted? Does this person need some sort of alternative intervention, meaning uh, you know, medication or things along those lines? I try not to speak on that since that's not a, really where our scope lends, um, but I try to paint the picture of what we have and have not done. So when they get to that referring provider, it's a meaningful appointment and they go in with an intent and leaving with some sort of outcome that's complementary to what we were doing. And um, I, I mentioned it earlier, then kind of veered off from it, but I have a patient right now who uh, had anterior hip pain, also posterior hip pain, little bit of an FAI presentation, a little bit of a labrum presentation. It was almost too nonspecific for each, but if I had to put them under an umbrella of a diagnosis, it would be suspected FAI with suspected labral involvement. Um, we've had great success. He's about seven visits in now. He went from having pain with sitting and walking and driving to at our last session, we're doing, you could name any mobility drill and we're doing that on the turf. He's doing a full strength workout with uh, squatting, hinging, lunging uh, variations. And we just recently got into running without any issue. Um, but he was referred from a physician they already had an MRI scheduled, but due to just authorization issues, it took about a month and a half for him to even get that done. So he just had the MRI, just found out that yes, he does have both of the things that we had mentioned, um, and he's getting ready to follow up with the orthopedic, and I communicated to him and to the orthopedic, uh, you know, aware of what the findings are, symptom profiles drastically improved, we're almost back to everything that we wanted to get back to from an activity standpoint and a daily uh, standpoint, um, and just educated him a little bit on uh, prevalence of labral tears, what are the indicators for acting on them outside of conservative care, which tends to usually be instability, unpredictable or uncontrollable pain pattern, uh, or a mechanical interference with the articulation of the joint, none of which he has. Um, the orthopedic that I'm uh, working with on this one is one who's very familiar with who we are, what we do. Uh, we have a good relationship with him. So um, I imagine that conversation is gonna, that he has with the orthopedic will sound very similar to us to, hey, we did an image. We found some things on the image. If you have any issues in the future, we have this as a working baseline to go off of, but it seems like what you're doing with PT is, is hitting all the blocks that it needs to. Um, and we don't need to do any further intervention on this.